So what's it like to donate blood for the first time as a former Jehovah's Witness? If anyone is familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, the one thing you probably know, the one thing they are known for, is their refusal to accept blood transfusions, even in life and death situations. Well, on July 29th, I donated blood for the first time as a former Jehovah's Witness. And July 29th is a significant date because it is the date that in a non-religious sense, I in just say I was born again <laughs> because it's the day that I was rescued uh, by police officers after spending uh, 14 hours in a creek bed overnight after being severely beaten by a random stranger. Uh, not only was I rescued, but my life was saved because I received multiple blood transfusions. Uh, now, the interesting thing was I was in a coma when the blood transfusions were administered, um, and it was my husband who, who helped facilitate that. And you might think, okay, well, if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, what's the big deal? Well, often when we leave fundamentalist uh, belief structures, we carry with us some of the practices and um, restrictions into, into our non-practicing life. So I've included this story in uh, the memoir that I'm writing. And the memoir is, is based on the attack and, and sort of the events of the attack, um, more around the healing power of music, the healing power of community and support, the healing power of blood. <laughs> and I share the story because it's a big part of my upbringing. It had a huge influence on my life. Um, not being able to accept blood and always having to talk about that with people who maybe for the first time when I'd say I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, usually often if they're familiar with the, the refusal to accept blood, that was often one of the first uh, things that was asked, uh, you know, is it true that you wouldn't accept a blood transfusion um, if it meant that you would die? Um, so having that conversation with many different people and kind of being in, in the, um, that being one of the focuses of people's attention with Jehovah's Witnesses um, made receiving blood and ultimately donating blood a very significant to me on a personal level. So if you are a one of Jehovah's Witnesses currently or a former Jehovah's Witness, you may be wondering, what's it like to donate blood? A simplified way of saying it, it's, it's a very straightforward process. You go to um, the clinic kind of as if you were, you know, like going to a lab to, to give blood for tests. And uh, they ask you a series of questions and uh, give you snacks, <laughs> like salty snacks, sugary snacks, and water, because you have to stay hydrated. Um, then they uh, put a needle in your arm, just like they would for um, a blood lab. And they with draw, I want to say um, about two cups, so 500 milliliters of blood. So you can see the, the blood bag in the bottom left of the picture, and you can see um, it coming out of my arm, <laughs> stating the obvious. Uh, and there's a ball you can squeeze um, to, to kind of just keep the, keep the blood flowing. And you lie there for about 10, 15 minutes, and then you wait in the waiting room for, for another period of, of time uh, to, to make sure that you don't have any negative reactions. It was a really simple process, and I didn't feel any weakness or faint, like, you know, what, what some people might experience. I didn't experience that, which, which made me happy. Um, but ultimately, the act of doing this um, was very significant for me on a personal level. And doing it on July 29th as a way to give back to all the people that, um, to say thank you for, for all the blood transfusions that I received. So now every July 29th, my husband and I have, have made a personal commitment to donate blood as uh, to recognize the, the anniversary of, of that date. So, in the, the memoir that I'm writing, um, I have I keep a picture of it 
you know what they say, like the vision board thing. It's called Unbroken, a Victim Impact Statement. And while the memoir isn't exclusively about being a former Jehovah's Witness, uh, because it's how I was raised and why I was a practicing member into my 20s, uh, late 20s, um, it's a, a theme or a sub-theme throughout the memoir. Um, so there's a part specifically that deals with blood transfusions. I thought I would share that part of the memoir with you. Um, this is the rough draft. It hasn't been edited. So if you're like, oh, she spelled that wrong or that didn't sound right, don't worry, it'll be fixed. But it's in uh, the, the fifth chapter called A New Life. And I'm naming all of the chapters after uh, song titles of songs that my husband has written and, and um, uh, produced and shared <laughs> publicly. So I refer to blood in the memoir here where I say, a pile of unopened mail sat on my desk. One envelope contained a bill for the ambulance that picked me up from the scene of my attack. Talk about adding insult to injury. It should have been sent to my attacker. Another envelope was from Transfusion Medicine at St. Michael's Hospital. I didn't know why I had a letter from them, but the word transfusion caused me to catch my breath. I opened it with apprehensive curiosity. It read, in accordance with both provincial and national standards, we are informing you that you received a blood or blood product during your visit at St. Michael's Hospital. Old thought patterns resurfaced. I was taken back to my upbringing as a Jehovah's Witness when reading those words would be translated as, in accordance with doctrinal standards, we are informing you that you will now die at Armageddon. Accepting a blood transfusion was tantamount to apostasy. Blood transfusions and apostasy were two things adherents feared and avoided at all costs. Up until the time I stopped practicing the religion for the third and final time 20 years before, I had carried a signed card in my wallet nicknamed a blood card. It was a medical directive not to administer a blood transfusion to me under any circumstances. This was not because I didn't want to live, but because I didn't want to die at Armageddon. The card invited medical staff to contact a hospital liaison committee for information about witnesses' refusal to accept blood. I used to think how loving the organization was to have elders who would communicate with doctors on our behalf. What I didn't understand at the time was that this committee of men was not there to help you live, they were there to help you find the courage to die if alternatives to life-saving blood transfusions failed. Blood was considered sacred. Once it left a body, it could not re-enter, and it was not to be stored or shared. Accepting a blood transfusion was considered an act of disloyalty to God, punishable by disfellowshipping, social death from the congregation, and death at Armageddon. Until I read the letter, later confirmed by the hospital summary report that she received additional blood products to treat her ongoing hypertension, I didn't know I had received blood transfusions, or why. I didn't even know my blood type. I shared the letter with Rob, my husband. It was he who told me my blood type. He also shared the story behind its revelation, the distress of not knowing, the kind nurse, the irony of be positive, the birth of a mantra. Perhaps if I had donated blood, I would have known my blood type, but donating blood was also forbidden. For two decades, I had internalized the indoctrination and restrictions of a religion I no longer practiced. The be positive story diffused the tension and fear incited by the words blood transfusion. It was also the genesis of a new world view, a new world view reinforced by an unexpected phone call from a childhood friend. What's interesting is that I mentioned how we internalize the indoctrination and the practices. Even when we leave, it's like our brain is trying to call the color black, white, well, they're not colors, the color red, blue, <laughs> you know, it's ingrained in you that it's this way. So trying to break free 
with your practices, trying to change your worldview, it's very significant and, and very overwhelming. Um, am I glad I did? I'm so glad that I donated blood. And I, I feel ashamed that I didn't do it before because I haven't been a, a practicing Jehovah's Witness for, mm, I don't know, 24, 25 years. Um, so why did I wait so long? Well, it was the internalized indoctrination, the the internalized belief that I would die at Armageddon um, if I donated blood or accepted a blood transfusion. Um, so this new worldview, you know, it's affected my my perspective on blood and also my perspective on Armageddon. It's kind of become a bit of a bit of a, a comical thing to to refer to. So another place that I shared uh, the story of be positive, the the blood type, the the theme behind the messaging for my husband and I um, is in our Take Your Power Back show. I did one spoken word segment in the Take Your Power Back show talking about the healing power of blood, which I will share with you. I'll also include the, include the link to the full, full production um, in the comments section below. But I wanted to share the spoken word segment uh, that talks about blood and blood transfusions and what it was like to um, receive that. Here we go. How many of you here know your blood type? How about the blood type of your spouse or your children? If you've ever donated blood, you likely know the answer to that question. Up until a couple of years ago, I didn't know mine. When I came home from the trauma hospital, I read through my discharge summary. The first paragraph itemized all the injuries I presented with at the hospital. I had to Google pretty much everything that was listed there, except for one line. She received additional blood products to treat her ongoing hypertension. I'd also receive a letter from the hospital from Transfusion Medicine to inform me that I received blood during my stay at St. Michael's Hospital. Why am I sharing this with you? Imagine for a moment being raised in a high control fundamentalist organization that forbids its members to donate blood and forbids its members to accept a blood transfusion, even if it means you will die Accepting a blood transfusion to save your life now will cost you everlasting life in the future, or so the theory goes. If you or anyone you know has ever been in need of a blood transfusion, you know how they are affected by low hemoglobin. They are weak, they are tired, they have trouble breathing, they can't focus, concentrate, remember things. No doubt if someone you loved was suffering with those symptoms, you'd do everything you could to help them. When I first read the letter and the report, I had to pause and reflect. Reflect on my upbringing in a high control fundamentalist organization that forbids its members to accept a blood transfusion, even if it means you will die. I also reflected on how I felt. I was weak, I was tired, I had trouble breathing, I couldn't focus, concentrate, remember things. Imagine how hard it would be for someone to advocate for themselves in that condition. While I lay unconscious at the ICU, 
my husband became my advocate. The time when I first arrived to St. Mike's, the only word I can use was just chaos and, and utter despair for myself. All these teams came at me, left and right, all from the ICU and surgeons and from the, the brain trauma and the rape prevention and crisis. So many teams came to me and asked me all sorts of questions. They didn't think Kim was gonna make it. And in my whole shock, they asked the questions, what's her allergies, any medication that she's on? And I answered those to the best of my abilities during a time of, again, just complete chaos in my life. And when they came to, what's her blood type? And in that moment, I just completely broke down into tears and I, I did not know her blood type. And uh, they said she needs an emergency transfusion. Later that night, uh, a kind nurse came back to me after and she said, we, we, your blood, wife's blood type is B positive. And again, I kind of broke down into tears and started crying and I go, of course it's B positive. What else could it be? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. When I learned that I'd received blood, I was filled with gratitude. Gratitude to the multiple donators of blood that helped save my life. Gratitude to the medical teams and technicians who administered the blood. And gratitude to my husband who made sure I got the treatment I needed to survive. Learning that my blood type was B positive encouraged Rob to be positive. Through the healing power of music, I was helped to be positive. Being able to come home with my brain and body intact motivated Rob to write the song, Be Positive. That's what they'd like to play for you now. Rob became a hero and Be Positive became our mantra and the message we continue to, to share. So if you are a former Jehovah's Witness and you are considering donating blood, but you're reluctant to do it, uh, first of all, forgive yourself. Um, the internalized indoctrination, it's, it's festering in our neurons and it's really hard to break free. Um, it's really hard to embrace a new worldview and new practices um, when old ones are firmly ingrained in us. So if you do decide to move forward with it, know that it's not as scary as you might think. It's a very simple, clean, easy process and doesn't take much time and you never know you might save a life. So stay tuned for more videos and for my memoir, which will share other stories about uh, what it's like to be a woman in the Jehovah's Witness organization, what it's like to be raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and how that impacts other aspects of your life, for instance, uh, with the attack that I experienced. So on that note, I'll end with my new mantra well my mantra that's been around for four years and is reinforced on july 29th and that's be positive